Hey everyone, Doug here with BNH, and we have the new Apple Mac Studio here today, and it is a powerhouse of a system. As you can guess from the name, it's got professionals, developers, and creatives of all types in mind, thanks not only to its blazing fast performance, but to its desktop-centric design, which gives you all the connections you need in an impressively small package. Now, the model we have here has the new M1 Ultra chip, and it's officially the fastest processor Apple has ever made. But today, we want to see how it fares in some video applications to give content creators a feel for the new Mac Studio. Everything inside and outside is new here in the Mac Studio, but to start with some key specs, we gotta look at the M1 Ultra chip. Though the Mac Studio is configurable with the M1 Max, the M1 Ultra is effectively two M1 Maxes working together to effectively provide double the available power in the form of 20 CPU cores. This also doubles media encoding and decoding resources, and according to Apple, allows you to play up to 18 8K ProRes 422 HQ streams at once. The Ultra model also has up to a 64-core GPU, up to 128 gigabytes of unified memory, and with that, up to 800 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, which is crucial for high-resolution photo editing and, of course, 4K or 8K video editing. The one we have here is the 48-core GPU model with 64 gigs of RAM and one terabyte of solid-state storage, which is itself configurable up to eight terabytes. Another big feature of the Mac Studio is its extensive connectivity, which has been, shall we say, a contentious issue on some Macs lately. Apple has really listened here, though, and provided a bevy of connections for all your peripherals, which we'll get to later on. But the important things to note here are the front-facing Thunderbolt 4 ports and SDXC card reader, which you can see, along with legacy USB-A ports on the back. And later, we'll take a quick look at Apple's new 27-inch studio display, which you can see right behind me. It packs a gorgeous 5K panel into a forward-thinking assembly. Overall, these are beautiful pieces of hardware, so let's put this new Mac Studio to the test. First, I wanted to see how performance was with raw video in DaVinci Resolve. No filters, effects, or grading involved. The M1 Ultra plays back through the 5K red code footage with no issues whatsoever, and CPU utilization is a reasonable 60%. Similarly, we tried this with some 4K red Komodo footage and even stacked multiple raw clips together. Again, with no effects or grading, we were able to easily play back a mix of 4K and 5K raw clips simultaneously. Very impressive. Looking at a single 4K clip though, I was easily able to stack 10 nodes of color grading and effects, including denoising, halation, grain, shake, and film damage. The effect is, of course, exaggerated, but the M1 Ultra pushed through it just fine. But I also wanted to see what performance was like in a real-world project. This 5K project already features several planner trackers, delta keyers, blur effects, and even some color grading as well in a 4K project. You can see the node tree here on the Fusion page. This is where the playback finally started to suffer, with playback rates dropping all the way down to 3 to 5 FPS. It's difficult to know the exact cause, but looking over at Activity Monitor along with DaVinci's own resource stats, CPU usage floated around 10%. The GPU side was pretty effectively utilized, though, in the 60 to 70% range. It's important to note that the M1 line utilizes a shared memory design, which should facilitate faster communication between CPU and GPU processes. With 64 gigabytes on this system, we weren't short on memory either, so given the low CPU utilization, there's probably something in the Fusion node tree that bottlenecks playback, at least for now. Exporting, however, is a slightly different story. Given that Resolve renders clips in the background, even a challenging project will eventually play back smoothly, but the final delivery still represents a benchmark of encoding performance. The M1 line is unique in that it comes with hardware, ProRes encode and decode support, which is part of what makes it so efficient in these workflows. Nothing else has that. Indeed, exporting a 46 second cut of this very scene with all the visual effects and grading involved took a minute 20 seconds to export to a 4K ProRes 422HQ file. During the export, CPU utilization didn't spike too many times above 30%, but GPU utilization almost always peaked to 100%, indicating that it's not just GPU processing of video effects, but using the video encoders as well. Next was a 10-bit 4K HEVC export with hardware encoding naturally selected. The same timeline was exported at a minute and 20 as well, identical to the ProRes export. With how close these two processes were, it 
almost certainly means that the bottleneck is before the encode takes place, as the hardware encoder could only process as fast as it's being fed rendered frames. Because of this, it wasn't really a full demonstration of the hardware encoders. That of course brought me over to Handbrake, which allowed me to select either hardware or software encoding. Using the ProRes file we had just generated in Resolve, I first did another 10-bit 4K HEVC export with hardware encoding enabled at 40 megabits per second. Now, as expected, the hardware encoder just chewed through the 46 second clip in a mere 27 seconds, predictably utilizing almost no CPU in the process. But that's the interesting thing so far, right? Nothing we've done has fully utilized the M1 Ultra's 20 cores. One of the easiest ways to do this is to simply use a software video encoder that can scale across every core. Switching over to X265, a software HEVC encoder, I exported an identical 10-bit 40 megabit per second file at the encoder's medium preset. CPU utilization immediately soared to the high 80s for the duration of the encode, which was 3 minutes, 38 seconds. Software HEVC encoding remains a tedious process even on the newest computers. So while the average encoding speed might seem pretty slow, it's actually not that bad. For reference, we performed the exact same encode on Apple's 2020 iMac with a 10-core Intel i9 processor. This processor, which is the top end spec for that iMac, completed it in 5 minutes, 2 seconds. Lastly, moving over to Adobe Premiere, my main focus here was in playback performance of some real-world projects. These projects feature a robust mix of 10-bit H.264 and ProRes RAW footage, After Effects lower thirds and titling, Lumetri color effects, transitions, audio track filters, blurring, scaling effects, and a lot more. The M1 Ultra blazed through most of these without a hitch, only tripping up on the most challenging of scenes, those being full-res burst photo collages, but otherwise had absolutely no problem scrubbing through entire projects with ease. Premiere does seem to lean more on the GPU and hardware decoders because when scrubbing through the footage, CPU use only occasionally exceeded 10%, and RAM use depends more on the shot being processed. Since most of our playback and performance was already tested in Resolve, I wanted to do a quick HEVC export here in Premiere to see if it's bottlenecked by the CPU in a similar fashion to Resolve, and if the M1 optimized version of Premiere can fully take advantage of the processor. So I set up a 4K HEVC hardware encode at 25 megabits per second. Disappointingly, hardware 10-bit HEVC encoding is still not supported by Premiere, even on the M1 Ultra, so a direct comparison was not possible. Regardless, the results were still really encouraging because this 12-minute, 22-second project finished encoding in just 10 minutes, 8 seconds, which is remarkable. Now get this, that same project exported on the i9 iMac finished in 14 minutes, 10 seconds. I suspect this difference is due to how much Premiere can lean on the hardware video decoders, 48-core GPU in this case, and the unified memory rather than just brute force CPU strength. While every test until now has shown impressive results, this was the only one where the particular benefits of the M1 platform possibly stood out. The more that applications take advantage of its architecture, the more we should see these kinds of jumps in performance. So let's take a look at this new, gorgeous 5K studio display. Yes, with a 5K screen that's 5120 by 2880 pixels across 27 inches, it's just gorgeous. The standard model here comes with a tilt-only stand, though you can also get one with a tilt and height adjustment, or one with just a visa mount. As you would expect, the Mac Studio fits perfectly under the monitor, so together they look great. As for the actual specs though, like most of Apple's recent displays, it supports the P3 color gamut for wider, more vibrant colors, and up to 600 nits of brightness, making it one of the brightest SDR displays that you can get. The True Tone function adjusts the monitor's color to your ambient lighting, which makes images appear warmer or cooler as needed. As a side note, while I admittedly like the True Tone effect as a user, it's not something I would recommend for any work where color accuracy is needed. Now, there's actually a lot going on inside the studio display beyond the panel itself. At the top of the display is a 12 megapixel ultra wide camera, which has support for Apple's center stage. This lets the camera track your movement to always keep you in the center of the frame during a video call. Complementing this is a three microphone array that features beam forming to keep your voice clear and consistent, along with support, of course, for Siri. The speaker system also supports spatial audio, such as Dolby Atmos, making it an all-inclusive display. 
What's fascinating about these features, however, is that it's actually driven by its own dedicated A13 chip, relieving the main computer from doing most of the processing. The studio display also has plenty of connectivity of its own, with a main Thunderbolt 3 upstream connection to the Mac Studio, and three USB-C connections next to it. So I said before that everything inside and out is new here, and for all the new hardware that's within the body, the design of the Mac Studio is itself pretty cool. At 7.7 .7 inches wide and 3.7 inches tall, it doesn't take up much space at all, and as I said before, it fits perfectly underneath the studio display. With a solid metal body and a square form factor, Mac users will probably be reminded of Apple's Mac Mini. Well, the similarity is mostly superficial, because for all the power packed in here, there's also a completely new and unique cooling solution that takes up a significant portion of the enclosure. While I didn't check temperatures here, I also never felt the need to, because quite honestly, even when encoding all the way at 100% usage, I never even heard the fans. It's a ridiculously quiet setup that keeps the Mac Studio cool. What users are really going to love, though, are the connections available here. Now, on the front side, you'll see an SDXC card reader and two Thunderbolt 4 ports. Do keep in mind that the front ports are Thunderbolt 4 only on the M1 Ultra model. The M1 Max model only has standard USB-C ports on the front. On the back side, however, things are equal across both models with four Thunderbolt 4 ports, a 10 gigabit Ethernet port, which is a very welcome surprise here for studio professionals who need high speed networking, two USB A ports, an HDMI connection, and yes, even a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. So, with an entirely new approach to the desktop, the Mac Studio not only fills the shoes of the iMac, but also approaches some serious professional territory with its high throughput connectivity, such as Thunderbolt 4. The M1 Ultra model in particular boasts impressive speeds across the board, and it's sometimes hard to believe how smoothly it plays back through some pretty complex timelines. There's still optimizations to be made in some programs, but things like the dedicated hardware video engines, up to the 64-core GPU, and just the sheer CPU performance alone should drive any creative professional's work. So that's it for the Mac Studio. I'm Doug with BNH, and I'll see you next time.